All right, are we all ready? Now I gotta remember what I say. <laughs> Welcome to the HR Social Hours special episodes of HR Wonder Women. It's Wendy and Anne, and tonight we are talking to Iko Bathia, and we are super excited to have her um, close out our 2018 uh, episodes. Uh, this was kind of a new trial thing that Anne and I started uh, after Sherm 18, um, a great idea we had and uh, looking forward to seeing what we can put together for 2019. Um, so if you listeners have suggestions for women that we need to talk to, um, please let us know, tweet us, um, use the hashtag HR Wonder Women uh, um, or HR Social Hour, we'll get it either way or tweet directly to us um, and let us know whose voices do we need to hear? Who else needs to, who else do we need to share out into the community and get in front of uh, of folks who need to hear these voices. Um, so I'm excited to see what 2019 brings. Um, how about you, Ann? Uh, Wendy, I am equally excited to see what 2019 brings. Um, this has taken off beyond anything that I ever thought. We were talking earlier tonight about uh, the HR Social Hour Half Hour podcast being a gateway podcast. Uh, the very first time I was ever on a podcast was as a guest of you and John. And here I am guest hosting with you on a regular basis, which is, is super fun. Um, and beyond being fun, I just am loving this time that we get to talk with HR Wonder Women, uh, getting to listen to the things that they have to say, getting to listen to them share their passions and their knowledge. And it's every single time we do this, it's a great learning experience for me. It, it really is. And it's um, I, there's been a call lately I've seen on Twitter to start seeing new voices at conferences and stuff and, and such. And so hopefully this will get a few more people out there and maybe we'll, we'll start seeing some of these folks, um, some of these awesome HR wonder women out at, uh, at conferences and can meet in person. That's, that's what I would like to see. I agree. So, I agree. Yes. That would be great. Well, let's get, uh, let's get us going here. Um, and why don't you introduce our guest tonight? Absolutely. So our guest is Iko Bethia, and I'll just preface this by saying this is my first time ever getting to meet and talk with Iko. I've, uh, I, I told her before we started recording that I've been doing a little stalking on LinkedIn to get to know her a little bit better. Uh, this is one of those situations where we put out a call and said, hey, uh, tell us who we should be talking to. And someone said, you should be talking to Iko and reading her bio and reading, following her on LinkedIn. I agree. Um, she is someone we need to be talking to. So Iko Bathia leads diversity and inclusion for Fred Hutchison Career Research Institute. In this role, she developed the first enterprise-wide diversity and inclusion strategy, including development of metrics, launching employee resource groups, and supplier diversity efforts, and internal education. She is also the principal of Bathia Consulting Group, a consulting practice focused on coaching leaders and organizations in removing barriers to inclusion. Her practice integrates operations, leadership coaching, and education strategies that yield measurable outcomes. For over seven years, Iko was with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she served as Deputy Director of Grants and Contracts Management. She led a cross-functional team responsible for compliance and due diligence review of investments. She developed and implemented lean workflow processes and facilitated change management throughout the organization. Iko has served on several boards and provided pro bono training for nonprofit boards on governance, strategic development, and operational efficiency. She also speaks nationally and locally on matters relating to leadership, diversity and inclusion, and organizational development. She currently serves as the board vice president for the Seattle Children's Theater and board secretary for World Reader. Iko earned her BA from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and her Juris Doctorate from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's a Hudson Institute of Coaching certified executive coach, her coaching practice focuses on emerging leaders and executive leaders who are developing their leadership competence in diversity and inclusion matters, including crucial conversations, self-awareness and biases, culture differences, and courageous conversations. Each day, Iko has the opportunity to envision new possibilities via her two sons. 
And with that, we are going to jump right into our questions. And our first question for you, Iko, is um, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this podcast is that we do want to amplify the voices of women of color in HR. We know that the experiences of women of color are different than that of white women. There are some commonalities, but too often feminist issues are defined by white feminists. So what are the unique challenges, or as Margaret Spence calls them, roadblocks that women of color face in the workplace? So one, thank you for the introduction, and I am super glad to be here and appreciate you two inviting me to be part of your podcast. Um, So as for your question, I think for women of color, it is if you think about all the things that women in a majority in terms of white women have to deal with, if you overlay that with race, racism, and those factors, then I think you get a pretty good idea of how it's compounded and the issues are different. we can talk about a lot of different specific contexts of how it shows up, but the best way is to think about being a woman and then not having the privilege of race on your side. I could, you also work with the LGBTQ plus community. Mm-hmm. Um, so are there other roadblocks that you've seen that are different than those that women of color experience? Um, and especially for queer women of color, how can HR be proactive in breaking down those barriers? So the one difference with, um, folks in the LGBT plus community is that an issue is that you're not readily necessarily identified based on your sexual orientation. Whereas with race, the majority of the time, race is more apparent without, without the person actually ident- speaking it or saying it or sharing that they're of a different race. The difference is with the LGBT um, communities, you can automatically default into a situation of covering, which is no one's actually asking you, what are your preferred gender pro- pronouns? Um, when you're married, if your spouse is he or she. So it's not an obvious part of conversation, which means that you're automatically in situations where you may have to perpetually, proactively out yourself. Um, And that part of your identity not be recognized unless you actually invite it to be part of the conversation. We're not in a place right now in our society where people automatically are in the space of providing their own gender pronouns or not assuming that everybody is heteronorm. So I think that's one of the differences with being part of the LGBT population, um, as opposed to when you think about race, standalone issue, and oftentimes gender. So to, I'm going to ask a follow-up question on that. Um, I keep doing this to you, Wendy. Sorry. Going to go <laughs> off script. Okay. But, that's all right. But so thinking about that, right? So thinking about the idea that um, race is just out there. You, you are, you can't cover that up. People know. So you, there's, there are roadblocks that you face being a woman of color. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is talk a little bit about what's the difference in how it's wearing on how it's internalized to be in a position where you're constantly, you know, you are seen for who you are immediately. And that, um, you know, you come up on roadblocks versus how is it wearing if you are, LGBT plus and you're constantly having to choose whether or not you're going to out yourself, which is sort of a different kind of, it, it sounds like, it feels like it's a different kind of oppression in that you're constantly having to make this choice of what am I going to do now and how am I going to explain myself? So it's both. I feel like there's, there's uh, the great benefit of having choice for one, but then there's also another part of having to, um, if you choose to be identified as, or if it's even relevant to a conversation, or this is part of your identity, you want people to see you fully 100% as the person that you are in all aspects of your identity and choosing LGBT as part of one of your identity frames that you would like to have introduced into a conversation. I think you're always weighing, and that's similar on both ends. You're always weighing, you're always Um, also gauging maybe where people are in terms of their beliefs or their approach or what you might need to counter or not counter. I think that that's part of it. But the other other part is like most, uh, pretty much most of us always want to be identified just as a person first. So you are not always in a situation, sometimes if you're at a table and you're dealing with a negotiation or something else, you are just trying to handle your business. And you're not necessarily hey, do I need to introduce this part that I have two sons or, you know, that I'm married or that my socioeconomic class is this? You're not necessarily seeing yourself divided up in these ways. So it's, it's freeing in that way, but also you're in situations where you have to use your voice, you have to speak, or it may actually be pertinent to the issue you're dealing with. So I would like to say that sometimes it's free, freeing and the ideal is that you not have to choose 
when you're identifying different parts of yours because none of them would be um, factors that would be detrimental to you. So that people are always inviting you in just as a person. So I do wanna talk about that as part of the aspect that you don't want to always be choosing and thinking about it and it's freeing not, ha not to have to. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah, yeah. No, that's really helpful and very interesting, thank you. So moving back into our scripted question. Uh, <laughs> Last year, you wrote a two-part article on the six traits of a good DNI leader. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, most businesses are struggling. What are some small changes that businesses can make to get those small wins that will then lead to bigger wins? So I will, I will tell you that the default way that lots of organizations do this is they look at their talent acquisition map and sure. they figure out how do we get more of this, more of that, more of you know, actually commodifying people. And how do I get higher percentage of women, higher percentage of black, Asian, what have you. And that's the how I think that most organizations see it as low hanging fruit and just upping their numbers. But the danger in doing that is that you're not thinking about the diversity and inclusion. So you're thinking about representation, but you're not thinking about how do you create this environment where people are there and want to be there and they're fully seen and appreciated and they can thrive. So I want to acknowledge how people uh, traditionally do it, but when you think about long-term lasting effects and the having sustainable practice of diversity and inclusion, which is what you want, you don't want to just have a diverse set of people um, who look different from every group. You want to be able to capitalize on what those different experiences are, who they are and what they're bringing to work and also creating an environment where there's more, there's more rigor in thought because people have these different experiences, but you only get that when you have the inclusion part, which is that people feel they belong enough where they can actually um, have a voice of dissent and not feel like there would be any um, punitive retaliation, be able to um, not only have a voice of dissent, but bring in experiences that might not be the norm or traditional way of seeing things. And so I always think about this as this equation, like the D plus the I equals the other eye, which is innovation. So you mm. want to make sure that you have this, not only diversity and representation, but in an environment where people are leaning in with each other, they're collaborating and they're bringing their full brain power and their full life experiences to the table. So when you want that inclusion part, there's a different depth of work that has to be done in an organization. And this shows up in different ways. One core part of that is when you think about internal education. So you're building the cultural competency of your organization, and this is part of your muscle. There are lots of different ways to do this. Now, again, I think about things in terms of best practices compared to what's commonly done. And oftentimes you see at a lot of organizations that they have, um, oh, let's have unconscious bias or implicit bias training, or let's have something on LGBT issues, but there are these categories also what's shiny and new versus thinking about diversity inclusion as a core leadership competency. So mm. if you do that as a core leadership competency, it's not segregated to this other category, which often is marginalized. Nobody wants to go to the diversity and inclusion training, but if you think <laughs> the same skills that it takes to talk about a topic that you're uncomfortable with, say you're not familiar with race or gender issues or LGBT plus issues, you're not wanting to go to the diversity and inclusion class necessarily. <laughs> but if you're a leader in an organization or if you're somebody who wants to be able to be challenged and connect with your organization and have an environment that thrives, then you're going to want to build that muscle. And there's simple ways to do that. It's a leadership competency. So again, when I think about what our internal education strategy looks like, it includes, for example, crucial conversations. Like, that's a, it's the same skill set to talk about something that you're unfamiliar with and maybe uncomfortable with as when you're putting somebody on a pip. <laughs> I mean, <Right>. you're difficult, <laughs> make your heartbeat go up, and you have to practice and you have to rehearse and really figure out where you're coming from. It's the same skill set, and you have to have courage and lean in and sometimes be vulnerable. The same um, training that you want for people so they're not seeing things black and white, and you want your leaders to be able to navigate the gray. How much do we hear that as a leadership competency? Being able to deal with ambiguity and navigate the gray, well, that's polarity thinking training. So I see that also as part of a critical just leadership competency versus a diversity and inclusion competency. But it's the same skill set that allows you not to see everything in black and white but understand that there's multiple sides of the coin and the issue so that you're challenging yourself in your automatic thinking. 
So again, I go back to what organizations should be doing in terms of retraining themselves and retooling their culture in a way that it can be um, more successful for people to thrive in versus thinking we're just going to amp our numbers up. And even though people are leaving, perhaps because they feel like they don't belong here or because the organization doesn't know how to invite people in, okay, it's like this revolving circle. And now we have to hire more again while the other <laughs> go out. Or you end up having other issues where people just feel stifled because they don't understand how to talk to each other and connect and you end up having a segregated workforce to a certain extent. So I would say one of the mistakes that organizations have is they're not building their leadership muscle. They're focusing on this thing called diversity and inclusion, but not recognizing that it just feel, fits into the full picture of having an innovative organization and one that's thriving. And then the outcome of that is that more people from different identity groups will want to be there because their leaders and knows how to communicate, how to invite people in. And best of all, they know how to exercise a degree of self-awareness and emotional intelligence where they're checking themselves on things and how they engage with people versus waiting for just more people to be hired who look different. And I think, I think that that's a completely different approach. It's longer term. It's um, sustainable thinking and you're creating cultural competence and you're creating leadership skills that will just continue to feed back into an organization. I, I really, I really like that. It, it takes diversity out of that. It's not just checking a box. And, and that's what, to me, diversity has been just one more box for HR to check. And, and it can't be because it's not enough to just have X number of women or X number of people of color. You need to have that. They need to feel like they belong. Right. And I like that you are putting it as it needs to be a leadership competency because that's where, that's what it all comes down to. Yeah. And I really beg of people when they talk about diversity inclusion or have opportunities to elevate it, that they always are speaking of it in terms of leadership competency and being a whole organization versus this thing. We got to, we got to do better than DNI, but no one understands really why or what <laughs> DNI is. And yeah. it's this weird stepchild of the organization that no one wants to deal with versus we want to be the best. We want to be innovative. We want to be leaders. We want to have the strongest leaders here. And a part of that competency just necessarily includes this diversity inclusion. Yeah. And, that, and honestly, that kind of segues into the next question um, as well, because they're, they're awesome leaders in, <laughs> in the movie um, Black Panther, which um, someone uh, on our podcast earlier listed that Black Panther as their favorite movie featuring a strong female cast and just made me love the movie even more thinking about it that way. But you, you have um, a beautiful essay that you wrote on Wakanda Forever and what it means to you. And among other things, you said women are powerful because women are powerful. So let's move away from barriers. So talk to us about the value of diversity and especially that value, the value that women of color bring to HR and to business. Wow, that could be a really long list. <laughs> when I think about the, the value that women of color bring, but uh, I thought you were actually going to go somewhere else with that question when I first thought, about it. <laughs> what does it mean? You know, women are powerful because women are powerful. And um, one of my thoughts about that, and I'll answer this other part though, but it's really important, yeah. for women, especially if you have women listeners on this, is that the idea that women are powerful because women are powerful, period, is the idea of coming whole and full to a situation, recognizing that everything that you're made of, that you came to offer, is everything that it, you have everything in you that you need. And that instead, oftentimes when I'm coaching executives, there's this automatic mindset of a deficit. And the conversation ends up being, they're not respecting me. How do I get, how do I, why, how do I get to a point to understand why are they not listening to me? Why don't they hear me? How do I get to a point for my organ? What do I need to do for my organization to appreciate me? How do I, and this, this, I, and what am I doing wrong? Or maybe this just isn't for me. And it's always this deficit mindset of I'm doing something versus coming to the situation as I am whole and I am everything and I am not carrying the issue. But how are there ways that I can navigate here with all the awesomeness that I come and bring? 
And I think that that is a very different mindset to, set to have versus always questioning ourselves. And now there's more conversation about the imposter syndrome. And when you're talking, there's always that inner critic that's just coming at you. You don't belong here. You're the only woman here. And the imposter syndrome, people don't talk about this as much, but it also asks you, oh, do you fit in that outfit? Oh, are they looking at, you know, what you oh, wore? Sure. Is your hair this way or that way? People don't talk about it in that way, but that's that inner critic voice. And just... Um, stifling that and having the answers already ready made where you've addressed that inner critic helps you to come to situations full and, and whole knowing that women are powerful because women are powerful. I'm coming to this as Ico and I'm everything that's needed in this because you've done the work now that the opportunity is there and now you knock it out with everything that you have and you're not thinking wow maybe I really shouldn't be the person here oh, he's right, oh, no one heard me or didn't listen to me. It must mean that what I said wasn't of value. So that's really what I meant by that, is coming full and whole and knowing that you're powerful and you've got this nailed because you've done the work and you're fully capable. So that's really what I meant by that, um, that phrase. I love that. We're the essence of everything that's great. Um, and then there are, there's this other idea of the benefits that women bring. And I think anybody here <laughs> who has a mom in their life, a sister in their life, an aunt, or any female can give you 600 reasons south of Sunday about why women are an added value. I mean, we're not all 100%, but everybody, everybody can name a million things south of Sunday of why women are powerful and should be a part of any organization. Now, whether an organization has equipped itself to value women is a different conversation whether an organization has done the work mm. it needs to do to I elevate women of color. Now that's a different situation. Um, so I wouldn't, it's just the same thing as when people ask me about why is diversity important and can you give me the business case for diversity? Um, I won't do it because no one's giving me the business case to have a homogenous organization. And there's a lot of evidence-based research out there already about the power behind diversity and inclusion and what it can do for companies, organizations, and people. So when folks ask me what can women bring, it's the same thing like I'm not going to justify or give you the argument about the obvious because it's such a given. Then I'm not going to give you a list. Right. <laughs> right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to defend that at all. And um, again, there's a lot of evidence-based studies out there as well. I love that response like nobody's asked for the business case of why we should have a homogenous organization right like so why right so why should we have to defend a business case for <laughs> having and, a diverse organization yeah and just now organizations are getting under fire of why do you have all white men on your board no one asks that and really the question should be right. you don't have any other representation is this okay so really the questions that we ask people shouldn't all, should also not come from this deficit mindset, right? Yes. What? This is crazy. There are all these white male CEOs here, and it makes no sense. And your whole, even your customer and client base looks totally different. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I hope you don't think that I'm being flippant, but I just want to shift the, um, the approach to the nope, conversation. No, nope, I love that. I love that approach. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think that you answered the question that we were trying to ask. Okay. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so next question, and I almost hesitate to ask this because I feel like this shouldn't have to be your job to answer it. Um, but what does allyship look like to you? What can people who want to be allies to people of color or to people who are LGBT plus, what can we be doing to be better? So I think one, um, being really proactive in educating yourself, to being super proactive at educating others around you. There's a lot of workshops now that I love. They're about um, bystander training. Mm -hmm. so a lot of times you run into people who they want to do the good, right thing. They're well-intentioned. They even have a degree of awareness in terms of recognizing when something was crappy and shouldn't have happened. But then they're kind of frozen, like, well, what do I do? So now there are several workshops, some of which I do also, which is it helps to train people to be in that situation that's usually heightened and scary for everyone, but to understand what to do in an actionable way. 
So there's lots of ways that you can actually do things. Um, but I do believe people should educate themselves, understand their own mindset, mindsets that might have, include so many biases, mm -hmm. uh, and really make a plan for themselves of how they are going to be better. What are the incremental activities you're going to take to be better? It can be as simple as these people are not in the room and they might be people who are getting less opportunity because they're part of these underrepresented groups Say, I'm going to actually recommend them for that stretch assignment. I am going to tout when they have successes in the room. So we're not getting the same people over and over who get the opportunities. Um, there's, so that's a lot of people couch that in the sense of sponsorship. The other part is just build your community. Like if your community all looks like you, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually um, engaging with different people and not just a coffee shop chat, but actually who comes to your house for dinner? Who never comes? Who are your kids playing with? So that they all look the same, there's a problem, right? So I think part of it is just building your community and it's actually a gift for yourself and you'll be richer for it. And your kids and your community will be as well. I do think there's also the idea of accountability within your community so that when people are perpetuating ideas and statements and using words that just aren't healthy or right, call them out on it. You know, I think that's so important are going to people and asking them, you know, practically, if you, especially if they have a relationship with them, hey, what can I do to support you? Hey, how can, you know, how can I help you with such and such and such? Just like you would do with any other person, but not to be afraid and to invite the conversation. And I think that self-education factor is really important. Um, you'll see on the internet, there's so many viral moments that go viral and you look at them and you think, wow, this is just what a good person would have done. But it's because the whole community of marginalized people, be it um, LGBT or people of color, are just so excited to know that there are champions for them who are in the, you know, who are white, who are heteronorm, who are willing to go to bed and willing to call somebody out to be accountable. Like you, sometimes you feel like you're always in this game alone. So when you see somebody who is white who jumps in there, you're like, oh my, you know, you're so happy when it's another person of color, you still have a degree of fear. If something could happen to them, like they're jumping in the line of fire. Right. When somebody's coming to the table with a sense of cultural capital, that's a whole different ball game, right? And you can even see on some of these videos that they're treated differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the ones that was really um, viral earlier this year was about the cookout in Oakland. And yep. but the woman who videotaped it was a white woman. And she reported this other white woman and she called her out. Mm -hmm. Never, and when the police came, they would have never believed it because the culprit started crying and really put on airs that she was the one who was under assault. But it was a white ally who right. was there with her voice, her whole presence, who video presence and who videotaped it, which changed the whole conversation. If one of those black men had done that, you can imagine how that could have ended up. Somebody could be dead now. Right. So yeah. that idea of recognizing the cultural capital that whiteness has and the privilege, because the privilege itself isn't bad, but gosh, all that you could do with it right. in terms of really trying to help create a more equitable and safe society for others means everything, right? Yeah, and, and that's what we're trying to do too, is figuring out, you know, for Anne and I, how can we help raise those marginalized voices? How can we use our privilege to do that? And this is one of the ways that that we can do that yeah and I think this one thing about um, you know voices that have been that have been marginalized um, true enough but it's also this idea of wow we're giving this gift also to the rest of the community because they have not done the work to find these amazing voices and figure out what mm -hmm. they're not getting right yeah. I mean you, you think about that and you think about all the richness in our culture from things like blues music right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or criminals um, from Baptist and gospel. Like, that's a gift everybody has now. So I always think about, yes, doing the work to help raise and elevate other voices because they are quality and deserve to be raised. But the other part of, look at what everybody's missing out on. Absolutely. I mean, I think about that. I think at the beginning, I said something about like, every single person that we've had a chance to sit down and talk to with this, I learned so much. And sure, I mean, I learned about being an ally and I learned, but I just, I learned so many things about HR, about business, about humanity. I, these have been really enriching conversations for me personally, and that 
we get to share them with other people and like, hey, listen to this. And this isn't about, yeah. oh, women of color need their voices amplified. This is like, hey, there are these women of color out there who have amazing things to say. Yes. And it's our privilege to get to listen to it. And we want to share that with many more people than might be hearing it otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for exactly. that. I, I did want to say one other note um, about being an ally. And I usually always talk about in term, terms of being an advocate. Because advocate just has almost this built-in um, essence of action, taking action. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, allies, oftentimes it ends up being, I'm going to be more aware. I'm going to read books. I'm going to go to work. Right. Go to lectures, but I'm not going to do anything actionable in a moment. <laughs> fill my head up with more and more Let knowledge. Let me retweet. So I can know everything. So we want to really make sure that what comes out of it is something that's actionable, that's actually going to do something, right? Yeah. Um, I will tell you, you didn't ask me this question, but it's making me think of this. Bring it. Bring <laughs> I'm going to say that there's this um, the hot topic of employee resource groups and the approach around employee resource groups. And I'll say at the Hutch, our approach has been a little bit different. And the reason why is that our approach for why we have employee resource groups is for the benefit of the center and changing mm -hmm. culture. Like our, our, our goal is to change culture. Now I know a lot of employee resource groups exist in order to increase retention. So they end up being almost tribe based. So it might be everyone who's LGBT plus is part of the LGBT plus group everyone who's black is part of the black group. So it provides these safe spaces and these niches where you have your tribe and you may feel more connected. But what happens when you think about what's the impact on changing culture, it may increase retention rates maybe, but it's, you end up possibly being in an echo chamber where it's all the people who are having this experience, who are in the know, who are talking to each other about having this experience and they can commiserate and maybe support each other in how they got through it versus changing the environment and the people who are out here creating these situations like help them to be better so the organization can be better not that you're going to be doing all the work but employee resource groups when we launched them at fred hutch it was very much about we're not going to launch one that is homogenous so when you think about our lgbt group it is not going to be all everybody who's the lgbt identified person who's in that group. As a matter of fact, you're required to have people who are straight and of course the intersectionality of race and when you, abilities and things should be represented there or else you end up being the club and the tribe and all the people who need to be at part in community with and learning so they can shift their own mindset, shift culture, they're nowhere to be found. We were um, launching a parents group and that, you know, when you think about if you have all moms and perhaps they're all the same race and maybe perhaps they're all in heteronorm relationships, I mean, it may be seen more as a soccer moms group versus a parent group. And how many dads are going to come to that? Right. How many LGBT parents are going to come to that? So you've already launched it in the spirit of exclusion and you're not impacting more people. You're not in, more people who are invited to the conversation are not necessarily going to come. So inclusion works in two ways in terms of there being an invitation, right? And I did, you want to make sure that you create a space for people to be educated and you're also creating an expectation that they be educated and self self educated as well. And that's the difference with an ally. Allies okay with are just going to force themselves to be one of the only in a community, right? If you're a male and there's a women's leadership group, you know, asking for that invitation to come in if it's not one that's already expecting others to come. So you can learn, not so that you can mansplain and dominate the conversation, but so that you can learn. <laughs> you can figure out what is it that you need to yeah. do. Versus every time you see Sally, you're asking her, well, what can I do to help you? And now she has to educate you. Show up and figure, you know, ask some questions or, or yeah. be, be with people, right? That's the right. best way to learn things. No, that makes so much sense. And when yeah. we think about, you know, um, you were talking earlier about how kind of inclusion has to come first and and that's something that um, I, I think about and talk about a lot is right that that we have to build inclusive spaces if we expect people to you know diverse people to come in and if your only goal is retention then basically you create those kind of affinity groups and basically what you're saying is well we can't make our entire space a place where you can be your full authentic self so we're going to give you this little pocket where yep. you can be your full self 
so that you can, you know, suck it up and keep working here because at least you have one place where you can be real instead of like your employee resource groups where you're saying, no, look, we want to make sure that everybody is real all the time. So we're going to put in the work and we're all going to come together and we're going to talk about these things and figure these things out so that you can be real all over the place, not just when you're with your little group. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And everybody commiserate together. Right. Exactly. You get it, Anne. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I go, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show and it's really segueing really well. Um, but we, we have our question connection with, and this, uh, for the HR of Wonder Women, we have a little uh, extra female player on it. But our first question is really jumping off of what you're talking about. It's about networking. And so, um, you know, how has networking been effective for you? What have you done? What have you found to be really that works for you that we can share with other folks so that they can build their network and increase the diversity and inclusion within their own network? Okay, so I will tell you a little known secret. I am an introvert. People don't I guess join it. Club. Join the club. <laughs> so it's really, um, I do not understand you all. I feel like I'm the only extrovert that is out there on this podcast willing to be like, I can meet anyone. I mean, I, I do it and I'm, I'm fine, but I, it really does drain me. So I have a lot of tools that makes networking really easy. I love meeting people and speaking with them. I just get kind of drained sometimes when that's more of the equation than less. Um, so there's a few things I don't think about networking as networking. I think about it as relationship building. Um, also, when you come with the mindset of relationship building, you're really engaged with that person, connecting with them as a person versus that idea of what can they do for me and why do I need to network with them, right? Uh, the other part is I think for introverts and others, it's always great to kind of have some background context about people as well so that you know where you might have commonalities. I think um, when you go to an event or what have you, thinking about who are two people who are really interesting that you just like to meet and know, doing that so that you have a target and a focus and you're not just this wildflower in the room. Uh, the other part is relationship building can be as simple as um, having coffee chats. When I first moved to Seattle, I made it a point that every week I would go to coffee with two people. Um, a week and it was really easy because it's coffee and it's not lunch and it's not dinner and it's not happy hour so <laughs> a finite window of time because everybody's got to go to work <laughs> you do it at the beginning of the day when you still look like presentable and civil <laughs> and it's you know who doesn't want to grab coffee or tea so well, again you get coffee do that twice a, you know i'm seattle so definitely coffee um but i would always do that twice a week and it was just amazing and it allowed me to have this tangible goal now it's more, um, you know, every quarter I'll agree to be on a panel. And panels are also great for introverts because everybody comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm a connector, so I love um, connecting people with one another. And I think that's always a rich way to relationship build as well. Um, because when you're um, connecting people with one another, they're always thinking about, oh, you know, this would be great for um, – X, what, Wendy, you know, Wendy or Ann, I'd love to introduce Wendy or Ann. I think that it's like it um, becomes this virtuous circle where people bring you in, even though you didn't have to do something really difficult. People think about happy hours and um, going to parties and things where you don't know anybody. And it doesn't have to be that scary. You can very much make it so that it accommodates your personality. It's accessible to you. And I have two little kids. So the after hour evening things just don't work for me as much. But sure, coffee in the morning, I can make that happen and doesn't interrupt my work schedule. So there's so many things you can do to make it so that it aligns with your work and career um, cadence and also who you are as a person. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, tell us about which women that you uh, read or follow for professional insights. Gosh, I have so many. Um, so there is a woman, Avis. Um, Weaver, I think her name is now, but she's a media specialist, and I love what she um, what she says all the time. They're always really powerful. I'll send you her name later. Oh, awesome. Also, Cher Jones on LinkedIn, and Cher has these videos every Thursday about, like, social media, and it's like this little video that's, like, five minutes, and she's fun, and she's hilarious, and she's always just telling you how to get yourself out there. So one, it's a woman, it's a woman of color, and she's just amazing and expert, and it's a quick video tip. 
So I follow her as well. And then I have people like Ava du DuVernay, who I love and I follow. Um, and there's also a lot of political pundits I follow as well. I love Angela <laughs> Um, people just unapologetically black and uh, you know like Angela Rye so there's a lot of people um, on that level who just make me feel like yeah I'm gonna get you know I'm gonna conquer the world and no need to be fearful or apologetic so I love those types of voices of course who's not a Brene Brown fan right <laughs> um, so I have yeah I have a, a, a lot of people who I follow out here Avis Jones de Weaver is um, is the lady who I follow and she's just a great media commentator so awesome I'll have to look her up all right so favorite movie that features a strong female cast you said it <laughs> My finger, of course for sure yeah. it's a good one it's a good it's an awesome movie yeah yeah those women were amazing they were amazing so what you you just made you want to go out there and just like fight for it all, right? Put it all on the table. Yes. And look yes. keep doing it. Exactly. <laughs> With or without the wig. <laughs> yes. It, it did make me want to like redouble my efforts at the gym, I will say. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. Or not. Just be, just be out there and be powerful. Yes. 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 Uh, what about a favorite female musician or band? Love Sweet Honey and the Rock. Yes. Mm -hmm. Love Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. I like Pink too. Okay. Who doesn't love Beyonce? Yeah. Who doesn't love Adele because Adele loves Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I have got a lot of women singers, but I really like um, old music. I'm still a big Janet Jackson fan, so I love oh, the oldies Janet. too. Can you believe I'm talking about Janet as an oldie? What? I was I thinking that as you were saying it, I was yeah. like, oh, like, oh, oh, wow, yeah. Wow. But yeah. I know. Yeah. All the music I like is, is on like the oldies but goodies station. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's where I am. Um, yeah. Oh. Love Diane I, Reeves. I, just, I have a lot of jazz folks who I love too. Oh. All right. Awesome. Oh, okay. Favorite female protagonist in a book? Hmm. Gosh, I mean, the books I've been reading now are nonfiction. Or um, movie, television show. Strong, you know, favorite fictional, fi fictional woman. I mean, who doesn't love Viola Davis? Um, oh, love her and in everything she does. Everything. Everything. <laughs> love her. Um, I watch a lot of shows that people probably aren't familiar with too. They're like the, the English murder mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> I watch on, those. Um, on, on video. So there's a few of those that have um, the female detectives who I love. Um, but yeah, I would say Viola. I love Queen Sugar. I love the women on Queen Sugar. And that's one of Ava DuVernay's shows. Okay. Uh, I mean, all of those women, they're all so different, and I, I, love, I, I love them on by, gosh. So I would say probably between Queen Sugar, those uh, <laughs> women in that storyline, one of my favorites. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So when you are not listening to Janet Jackson or watching Queen Sugar or... <laughs> Black Panther, what kinds of things do you like to do outside of work? Hang out with my boys. They're <laughs> awesome. So I have two boys, they're ages nine and 10, oh. and they're awesome. They always, oh, I mean, fun. the one thing about becoming a mother of boys is being That's amazed fun. at how sweet they are. They're mm -hmm. so sweet. Like, who would know? Um, so I love hanging out with my boys. <laughs> And and that's yeah. such a great age too. They're that's like such yeah. a fun age where you get to do really you, not just do cool things with them, but have really great conversations with them, and they are are thinking really deep and abstract Amazing. thoughts, and mm -hmm. still want to hang out with you. Yep. Oh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, Aiko, you have survived. Yay! You survived our questions. Okay, you survived yay. our conversation. It was awesome. I'm so happy yay. we were able to make this finally happen. Um, many you know, schedules are always fun. 
Um, oh, this is your opportunity to tell our yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no barriers here. Well, it looks like we may have lost Ico a little early, unfortunately. Um, but check the show notes for um, for how to get in touch with her. Ico, thank you so much um, for joining us. Uh, we will be in touch soon, and um, happy to to meet up with you. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to meet in real life. Um, and how can our guests get in touch with you? Sure. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Ann Tomk, A-N-N-E-T-O-M-K. I also have a blog, HR Underground at, Word Pro at WordPress, and I write about HR stuff there from time to time in a minute. And I write a personal blog at The Road Less Peddled, also a WordPress blog. Uh, but most of, my, most of my interactions are on Twitter, so Twitter is definitely the best place to find me. Same here. Um, find me on Twitter. I'm Wendell93. Uh, happy to connect that way. Um, follow my blog as well, um, mydailyjourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And I do have to give a shout out to the HR Social Hour Twitter chat. Uh, fourth Sunday of each month at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So, um, yes, Aiko, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and thank you for joining me, and uh, we will see you all in 2019. Have a great evening. We'll see you soon.